single drop of water. Basic chemical composition of three molecules, hydrogen and oxygen. Something very unique, for me at least, and to many of you, to a certain extent. Water is only found in, luckily, our planet, and has been, or is, the basis of life, and also civilizations. This very little drop that we see every day from the sky accumulates as it falls into our soil, gets absorbed, gets filtered, and forms something magical that runs through, that runs through most of our city centers, rivers. And rivers play a big part of my life. I grew up in the small city of Ipo, where weekends are spent in nearby rivers or waterfalls, normally just 15, 20 minutes away. And we were always outside, enjoying nature and environment. Rivers are also the heart and soul of cities. And as you can see here, this is Masjid Jami in Kuala Lumpur. And if you notice the steps, these are the steps devout Muslims would take to the river for the process of ablution, wudu. This is how intimate our relationship is with rivers. And many, many civilizations started off next to rivers. And in my last 18 years, this is a picture of me a long time ago, before I even got married. And you can see it's a big river behind me. I was working for an international environmental organization. And one of my biggest tasks was to look at what does it take to engage government agencies to look at more holistic ways of planning a river basin for the benefit of communities. This is probably in 1998. And I remember two years later when I published a paper, right here in JB actually, uh, during that time, uh, to, to a very big audience, and I made two predictions. One was Sungai Kanching, which is a tributary to Sungai Selangor, which was the river basin that I was studying, was going to collapse. The second information I divulged was during that time, I was doing my master's in biotechnology, and I was looking at the particular chemical uh, compound which we use at home as an insecticide called heptachlor, and how it affected the male reproductive system. Of course, my test subjects were rats, not human beings, mind you. It would be very difficult to test it on men. Um, and during my research, and so I was doing two research simultaneously, one for my master's and one for this organization that I was working with. And as I took this river samples and monitored, I was quite shocked because I found that exact chemical compound that I was doing my research in the river. And I hope you know this, 80% of the water that comes from your tap comes from rivers. So to know firsthand, or to know in detail what actually is in the river system, obviously is very, very alarming. And that began, really, my journey uh, into studying freshwater ecosystems, into studying what does it take from an environmental perspective to protect river resources for the benefit of people. And I do this in various, various ways. Um, as you know, uh, environmental education is almost non-existent uh, for many of us. Many of you probably have not stepped foot into areas of wilderness. I, I've, I've had a chat with many 18, 17 year olds that, that join our nature camps. And the amount of stress that parents go through, making because they know that their child is going to enter into this rainforest with me, it's, it's a uh, Pretty interesting to, to, to observe. So I, I do all sorts of um, activities and programs related to um, river conservation and um, re river awareness. Um, this picture here is, is my daughter uh, on the left and her friend Bryn 
And I remember when she was two and a half years old, um, when I brought her to a river, she refused to go in. And it was a clear river, mind you. Obviously, it was in a swampy area, so it had tannin in it, so it was a bit brownish, but it's really clear. You can see right through the bottom. And she refused to go in, citing things like, the brown, thing, the brown stuff by the side there is, is dirty. Actually, they're just uh, brown leaves. And what are these little, little green, green slimy things that are inside the river? Actually, they're just algae. But however, when I introduce her to Bryn, this is a little boy you see on the right-hand side, and, and he's got a slight advantage because he's always out in nature. Um, he pulled Mia's hand, ran to the river with a butterfly net, and in split second, that fear of entering an unknown territory for my daughter disappeared. It was fun. It was nice to get wet. It was so interesting to look at damselflies and dragonflies. It's so nice to catch fish and then release it back again. And in that instant, her whole experience with this river changed. She didn't have a choice. I do this for a living. And so this was a litmus test for me to test how resilient she is so that she could follow me in other trips. The next time we came back to the same river, she was my guinea pig already. The next time we came back to this river, I had a busload of kids, 32 of them, which I was responsible to educate them or make them appreciate the river. Like Mia, they had reservations. They had that same look my daughter had. They had that same sentiment. They were afraid to even walk on the riverbank for fear, There's so many fears. And when I asked them, why? Well, my mommy says, you never know what will bite you. My daddy says, there's sometimes things there that will hurt you, that will harm you. And it's sad. It's sad to hear that children these days are so deprived of the very, very normal things that I grew up with. So every time when I do these activities, Mia is with me. Because the minute they see a child younger than them, or about their age, running to the river with such enthusiasm, with such love, with such passion, it breaks all the barriers they had before. Unfortunately, our country is also going through an odd juxtaposition. We want growth, we want development. At the same time, ensuring that all our basic needs are met. With this, we have evolved to somehow treat rivers a lot different than we have. We have heard of so much stories, even Sungai Seget, of how it was so glorious those days it served so many functions. It was the heart of community, heart of society. With information like this, as you see on the screen, is worrying. And mind you, 80% of our water that we drink still come from rivers. What are we drinking? But luckily, luckily, there is a surge, or a revolution, you can call it, a river revolution, of a change in mindset and change in the way we view things. Sungai Seget has gone through a lot of transformation. In fact, if you read the board, it was once buried underneath. That's how we deal dealt with rivers those days. If it was a problem, we get rid of it, out of sight, out of mind. But there is a new realization now that rivers is going to be the next step to take in terms of developing of a city, or developing of a high-class society. This is Sungai Klang, or Sungai Gombak, in Kuala Lumpur. It has already started some of this work to revitalize these rivers. Many parts of the rivers in Kuala Lumpur are underground, have not seen daylight for 20 or 30 years. In the next four years, these rivers will finally surface for you to view. But many of this are just engineering. Engineering can solve quite a lot of issues, but it doesn't mean that engineering can make that river mean more to you than it was before. And this is the part 
where I've been involved in the most in the last 15 years or so. What does it take for you as an audience here to be involved in river conservation or river rehabilitation, whatever you want to call it? And the, one of the ways that we're doing it is working very closely with local authorities to talk to people on the ground, to talk to school children, to talk to communities on what are their roles in, in, in building a better city and making sure that the river doesn't end up flooding the very, very home that they live in. And this is my dream, to continuously have rivers like this, for not just for me to enjoy aesthetically, but for children, for children to be at peace, for children to learn the amazing things of nature, to learn biology, chemistry, science, whatever you want to call it. But most importantly is this respect. Respect for the very system that gives you life. So TEDx Sungre Segit, and I ask you this. Today has been amazing with the kind of speakers that are here to talk about the variety of issues and the knowledge that they have. They can tell you many, many times, but many of you will also forget. They may teach you many, many things, but some you might forget too. Most important of all is, after today, how many of you are going to be involved? So for environmental activists like me, we've moved to a whole new level of engagement with societies already. It's enough of expecting the responsibility of environment to fall in the hands of government. It's not fair to also expect the environment to be governed by a certain entity. Environment as a whole is governed by us. And it is you that can make a bigger difference to not just Sungai Seget, but to all the rivers that will be and eventually will be the heart and soul of JB. So with this, thank you very much and hope that TEDx Sungai Seget would give birth to more Johorians that realize how important your role is to make the city more sustainable. Thank you very much.